Other things happening in Washington and with the Justice Department and here on gun control, our new AG is here to talk about it. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good President's Day evening to you. A little snowy this morning, but not as bad as we thought. Hey, it's winter. Don't complain. DLT's actually stayed ahead of us. And, and Mother Nature's actually given us a break with the budget so far. So keep your fingers crossed. We're running deficits all the time, so maybe we can rake some. Uh, busy, busy, busy stuff in Washington and here some important gun control legislation discussion from last week that we'll touch base with our attorney general on. Uh, Peter Narona has been here when he announced. He'd been here before the election. The election was easy for him. He won't say that, but it was. He's been here to set up the big picture, but now um, to, his, uh, to his promise and to his credit, uh, he's now here to discuss the stuff. There's stuff, you know, that now will happen day in, day out. It's called the news and the news cycle. And, um, I appreciate him uh, being in attendance. So I'm going to forego the monologue or thoughts by myself because I think most of what's in the news is something I'd like to check in with him on. How about this headline to start? Uh, this is the clip that everybody's playing, not because they're exploiting the speech, but because it was so glaring, right? You saw this Friday or a clip of it. I could do the wall over a longer period of time. I didn't need to do this, but I'd rather do it much faster. Uh, incredible. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, see not, not off today? It's a state holiday, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> not, not for state employees. Glad it, to be it's working not, today. It's, it's it's not, not, this is not a state holiday. No, it's not a state holiday. No, so we're on, we're on today. Huh. Courts are open. And we're open. And so we're all open. So Life goes on. All right. Um, security. Mm -hmm. What's your take? I mean, you've been in law enforcement your entire professional career in the ag's office then as u.s attorney now back in the attorney general's office as the boss clearly you get a lot of uh, information on uh, immigration matters mm -hmm. gangs all that kind sure. of thing what is the intel about what the border uh, is is challenging us with well there's no question that there's a lot of narcotics across the border um, when i was u.s attorney we did a lot of big narcotics cases with multiple kilo loads coming in but you know, they were coming in at the ports of entry and you know, I, uh, so, so there's no question that there's a flow both ways, actually, in contraband going back and forth, um, firearms going south of the border, drugs coming in. You know, the immigration side, you know, we've always had the, sort of an immigration issue there. Um, uh, by all accounts, it's gotten better, not worse. So if, if you're asking me about the president. Better meaning? Meaning that the, the scale of people coming in has actually gone down over time. Um, and. You know, again, my experience in terms of contraband, there were two ways that narcotics were getting to this part of the country from Mexico, and that's where most of it was coming from in the last decade or so. It was being transported across the country by vehicle, coming through a port of entry, or it was being mailed here. Um, so that's typically the way narcotics have gotten into the United States. Uh, I, I think the president's problem, frankly, with this national emergency is, is that he is either unable um, or unwilling to create consensus, and then has to do these end arounds that don't make a lot of sense. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, no, no argument there. Uh, does he shock you anymore? Uh, did, he ever, did he ever shock you? He shocked the right word. You know, I'm troubled about where we are as a country. I mean, you know, um, I served two presidents in the Justice Department. Um, I don't, I've never seen anything like this, you know, whether it's you're looking back on my justice experience or just as a citizen, where, where, you, where you can wake up and read a tweet from the President of the United States, which seems to, in many ways to be so off the rails. You know, there was one, I think, this morning, you know, uh, taking shots at Rod Rosenstein, and Rod Rosenstein still works for him. Um, right. Yeah, so, so it, it, this is a strange yeah. place we're in, and not a good one. I want to get into that. Let's go back for immigration for a second. It, it, do you su subscribe to the idea that it might be reasonable to add some wall or barrier where it, where it is most consensus needed? Look, I, I think we need border security. There's no question we need to do a better job securing our borders. There's no question about that. Exactly how that plays out, I, I would be... I think all Americans would be more persuaded if we relied on the views of objective, nonpartisan experts to tell us 
what combination of things we need to make the, more, the borders more secure. I think the wall has become a political issue, not a substantive one. Um, and so, big picture, yeah, I think our borders could be more secure and need to be. Uh, I'm not sure the, what the president, in fact, I'm confident what the president uh, is doing is the way to solve that. So, for example, I had two colleagues when I was U.S. attorney uh, down in that neck of the woods, Arizona and New Mexico. And I remember asking the U.S. attorney from Arizona, it was Dennis Burke, was the same, why do you guys have such this problem in New Mexico? doesn't. So, well, the terrain, it's the terrain in New Mexico. It's just so much difficult to come across the border in New Mexico, whereas Arizona, much easier. It's, it's like literally a plane people just cross. So it's not like, it's not like a one-size-fits-all solution uh, to me, where you build a wall from, from coast to coast, to the extent that's even possible, being coast, Gulf Coast to, to uh, Pacific Coast. We ought to be relying on people who really understand the border, the experts, uh, put together some kind of a, an analysis and then do what they think. But we, we're way past that now. You know, we're talking wall or no wall. Um, and so I, I just don't think we're in a good place on that issue. Well, you relied on the DEA in, in a lot of ways for your, your case. The DEA information is that although, yeah, 90% uh, of our drug traffic here in this country is coming from Mexico, most of it does come, as you've noted, through the mm -hmm. ports. And the president doesn't want to acknowledge that. That, that, that has got to have Justice Department officials up and down the line just scratching their head. Wondering well, probably. What's next. I mean, you can't carry 9, 10, 20, 50 kilos across the border, really, very effectively. That's why it's hidden in axles and other parts of vehicles. I mean, it's ingenious, frankly, the way some of it gets across. Um, but uh, but it's getting it's getting across at the ports of entry because that's how it's easy to, easy to get it in. I mean, you're hiding it in a vehicle, um, in, in 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 all sorts of ways. And this border security enhancement will help to prevent that. I think, so. well, I think it will help if it's in the right place, right? We have to identify where it's, the, if we're talking about narcotics, where is it coming in? What do we do in that, in that space to make it easier to, to identify those issues? So, for example, if there's so many vehicles coming in that we can't do an adequate job of inspecting each vehicle, then we need to add capacity at the border so that we can inspect them in a better way, rather than building border walls, say, in New Mexico, where we really don't need them. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about in terms of a objective, in-depth analysis of what we really need, listening to people who actually know. What is, your, what is your assessment of the current drug environment here that you'll be prosecuting? Well, I think we've got two things to worry about. You know, mostly uh, we've got to figure out where we're over prosecuting the addicted. So I don't think our resources are well used on people who are simply addicted to narcotics. I think that we've made a sea change there, I, I think from the point of view of the prosecutors. So we have to continue to focus on the dealers, and particularly the cartel-connected dealers, meaning the Mexican cartel-connected dealers that are bringing heroin and fentanyl into, these, into the state, into the region, and killing so many Rhode Islanders. Does law enforcement know who they are for the most part? Oh, we, yeah, we know. We know which cartels they are. Sure we do in Mexico. The, the question is... I'm talking about here. Sure, yeah, so... I mean, you, I mean, you got you got a... Sure. You got a board with most of the players, or are you, or, or are you guessing all the time? As well, to no. I mean, look. You know, one of the, what I, what has really changed is how much. Uh, these investigations cross state lines. We had a huge advantage in the U.S. Attorney's Office because we could connect with other U.S. Attorney's Offices or the Maine Justice Department. You know, our wiretaps could go all over the country. A little harder to do from the state perspective, but it's all, you know, we'll do it. Hmm. All right, when we come back, I'm going to pause here. I have some running room when we come back. We'll, we'll talk about the 60 Minutes uh, episode last night and uh, Andrew McCabe with some incredible revelations. Stay with us. Yeah, so the CBS uh, comes up with this very interesting interview with the former acting director of the FBI. Here's an excerpt. As you're sitting in this meeting in the Justice Department talking about removing the President of the United States, you were thinking what? How did I get here? Confronting these confounding legal issues of such immense importance, not just to the FBI, but to the entire country. It was, um, it was disorienting. It was incredibly turbulent, incredibly stressful, and it was clear to me that that stress was, was impacting the Deputy Attorney General. We talked about um, why the President had insisted on firing the Director and whether or not he was thinking about the Russia investigation and did that impact his decision. And in the context of that conversation, the Deputy Attorney General offered to wear a wire into the White House. 
He said, I never get searched when I go into the White House. I could easily wear a recording device. They wouldn't know it was there. This is your system you, yeah, that, you, that you just went across town on. Mm -hmm. This is your system. You didn't get a chance to see the whole interview. You're going to look at it tonight. The, uh, it, it, he's pretty credible. The only part that, that gives anybody any pause, and the president plenty of ammunition, is the idea that um, he's charged with lying by the inspector general uh, to FBI yeah. you know, on his, 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 his answers on the Clinton aspect of this investigation. His, I think, pretty credible statement last night was that, listen, with everything that was going on, I, I, I got a little confused as to some of the questions. Now, like, you know, but he wrote a book. He's out there. It's not like he's hiding behind lawyers. Mm -hmm. Take on this. Well, well look, I, I think whether or not he ran a follow of the inspector general, that doesn't mean he's lying about e everything. May not be lying about most things. I mean, you know, that's that's something we in the justice system deal with all the time. You know, who knows how that played out with the inspector general. Um, my my take is I listened to it and I you know I saw some of the clips and I read the news accounts of the uh, of the interview. You know, I can envision where that meeting took place, probably in the deputy attorney general's conference room where I spent some time. It must have been remarkable. It must have been remarkable. And 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 um, I have such uh, such good memories of what a strong department that place was. And at its heart, I think, still is. But it's going to be a very difficult time to be in the Justice Department. I can't imagine being there now. I really can't. Yeah, but you gotta, they, they got to do their thing. They do. The role is really, really important. Of course it is, yeah. So, and so, you look, it's a 10,000-person department, and the day-to-day -day work gets done. I bet you, if you were to ask, uh, now my criminal chief, the former U.S. attorney, Steve Danbrook, or Aaron Wiseman today, the current U.S. attorney, I think things are going along as they, as they go. Um, but it can't be a it can't be an easy place to work right now. Rosenstein is, is probably going to be exit stage left. The pressure of Twitter, McCabe was talking about it. The pressure that this president has put on the Justice Department on a day in day out basis is unprecedented, and you know he's asserting that Rosenstein wasn't laughing. This that's the story that he was mm. laughing about the wire. He said wasn't laughing. Uh, Rosenstein hasn't denied that he said he'd, he'd wear the wire. Rosenstein hasn't denied that he that he said. Uh, or, 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 or question whether or not the 25th could be explored. Uh, I'm guessing when he gets out, he too is going to have a, I don't know about a tell-all, but a set the record straight off, right? Yeah, probably. I mean, Rod's a very, I know him well, he's a very smart, talented guy. He's a little acerbic, so it's hard to tell, you know, not having been in the room exactly if he made the statement. Um, you know, what his intentions was were um, at the time. He can be sarcastic, so you know he's he's the one who I'd want to hear from to know how he meant it if he said it. Um, so we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. I don't I don't think he'll be shy though. You know when he when he moves on from from talking about how it went. I mean, and you can tell you know when you see him interviewed. Again, I know him pretty well. Um, you can tell that it's been that it's been difficult. And he knows it, and he's not afraid to signal that through through his comments. And again, he's got kind of a kind of a sarcastic, acerbic way about him. Bill Barr is going to have some decisions to make. I mean, the finesse of this is, you know, he pops Rosenstein. Rosenstein's already advanced that he wants to go, mm -hmm. but Barr gets on him right away. It looks like he's just doing the president's bidding again, right? That Barr needs to show himself as kind of an independent guy in the attorney general's office. What, do you have a guess as to what might happen here? Well, I don't, you know, it's a guess, but I don't think Rod Rosenstein will be with the Justice Department all that much longer. He'll just check out on his own. I think so, yeah, I think yeah. so, relatively soon. I, you know, I could be wrong. I don't have any inside information, but I think it's hard for him to continue in the job given the way the, the president has gone after him. It, 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 you know, the, the Deputy Attorney General goes to the White House fairly frequently, um, so I just don't know how that dynamic can work. Do you think the American people, Rhode Islanders specifically, understand what's at stake with the Justice Department under duress like this? Um, hard to say. You know, I always felt like in the in the U.S. Attorney's Office we kind of were below the radar a little bit until we kind of you know, way below the radar. Yeah, until we popped a big case, and then you know people would know we were out there. Uh, I don't know, but it is a really important mission. It is an important mission. Um, and then, look, there's, there are certain kinds of cases that only they can do. So I'll give you an example. We talked about the, the major drug trafficking cases. You know, Rhode Island wiretap pretty much is about players in Rhode Island. As soon as you go over to the next state over or to back towards Mexico or into the, out of the country, you've got to be in the federal system. 
So the work that they do, whether it be narcotics or some big financial fraud cases, um, they've got to they've got to be working and running well because you know we're we're really as the AG's office we're doing a little bit of that, but we're also DA's office, and so we're dealing with everything that comes in. I mean, it's a different mission they have. Um, and they have to do it well because their cases are, are important. Ours are too, but so are theirs. They're different, but they're, they're really important in what they do. And so they have to be well-led. What worries me as much, I was comfortable, I guess, with a Justice Department led by Rod Rosenstein because I know how capable he is. I don't know Attorney General Barr. I don't know who will replace Rod. But even though the White House was in turmoil from where I sit, the fact that Rod was running the show gave me some level of comfort that uh, the bulk of the organization would run well. But with Rod gone, uh, what does that mean for Mueller? But more, more than that, what does it mean for the overall department? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. All right. When we come back, we'll come home to some of these important issues. Stay with us. So maybe you missed this late last week. These weapons that we're seeking to ban have one purpose, to kill people. Governor Gina Raimondo proposing a package of gun control bills Thursday, including a ban on assault weapons, which defines the guns differently than last year's bills, a ban on high-capacity magazines, and a ban on guns in schools, with the exception of law enforcement officers. Parkland, Las Vegas, Tree of Life, Sutherland Springs, San Bernardino, Sandy Hook. The list goes on and on and on. In every one of those instances that I just listed, lives were taken because of use of an assault weapon. Talking points. That's talking points. Senator Gordon Rogers of Foster is a gun owner. He says banning guns on school grounds could make them a soft target. Having a concealed carry license, you don't know who's on the school grounds that have it. They have a legal right to do it, and, uh, and they're carrying legally. That could be a deterrent. Uh, if something does happen, it could be an effective deterrent. URI police major Mike Jagoda was a Connecticut state trooper in 2012 when elementary school students were murdered in Newtown. If you saw what I saw that day, there would be little, it would be, it would be hard not to convince you that there's no place for assault style weapons and high capacity magazines in our society. All right. Now, you, you feel strongly about uh, all three elements. It's the capacity limit, the definition of assault weapons and banning those, mm -hmm. grandfathering in those who have them but having to re-register them more or less, yep. and then, then, then the school property. You and I have had a great uh, rat-a-tat. The longer form of discussion on this is at 630 WPR.com on a podcast where the AG and I uh, debate this. Your overall sense of, of the purposefulness of this package is what? Well, look, I, you know, I think... I think it's a mistake to assume that these are all these are going to save every life that, that that could get lost, but they can save some lives, and that's why I believe in them. To me, it's all about balancing the risk, and to me, these are measures that I think are common sense and may have an impact and save some lives, and that's why I'm behind them. The school thing is something that you and I uh, had a healthy debate on. Mm -hmm. You gave me pause. You're, you're, you have a hypothetical thought in your head that somebody who has a concealed carry permit but is not necessarily trained in a stress situation could end up in the wrong crossfire. Well, sure. I mean, you know, the, the fact of the matter is unless you have a police background or maybe a military background, concealed uh, carry uh, permit holders don't train uh, in either how to deal with stressful situations or in decision making the way people do in the academy. They just don't. You have to qualify with a target and then pass a background check. So the notion that you shoot a lot at the range does not help you make decisions in stressful situations. Those are two totally different things. And so um, to me, the only people I want carrying on school grounds where you know, our, our most vulnerable you know, spend the big part of their day are police officers, and I think that makes sense. And I don't think it's a huge sacrifice to ask people who are carrying a weapon to lock it up in their trunk or in a, in a box and or a case and put it in the trunk while they go in and see their kid's art show or pick their kid up. I just don't think that's, you know, again, it's balancing. I understand the arguments on the other side, but you, we have to make a choice, and that's where I land. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you drew me to a jump ball. I still, I, I still think the arguments, I, the problem with all of this gun conversation is that Everybody, and you have, to your credit, admitted that nothing is a cure. But then I think we have to be careful in just keep, if just brainstorming potential cures, mm -hmm. right? Just, just, just kind of like churning out the anti-gun 
discussions without a lot of what I think ought to be the, the, the more prevalent conversation, and that is securing facilities, mm -hmm. school resource officers across the board, um, mental health inv investment, all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that really at the root of this problem versus the weaponization argument? Well, I think they all blend together, right? You know, when I was out, uh, when I was speaking with you, a year ago, I was talking about the 10 things that I think, if you put them all together, can make progress. It's not just these three. There's a lot more that I think we could be doing, locally and nationally. Um, so some of it is mental health, but not all of it. And you can only secure a school so much, Dan. If a school's got a window in it, there's only so much you can secure it. So a lot goes into this, but I think these bills are common sense measures going forward that balance the risk in the right way. All right. You have a headline here um, from the weekend Ten religious and secular organizations in Rhode Island hailing your decision to get out of a case with Maryland and the church-state issue there. What, uh, give me 30 seconds on what this was. Yeah, look, there's a case in Maryland um, involving a cross and a rotary uh, that was dedicated to uh, veterans of World War I uh, back in the early teens. And it's got a very complicated history, a very factually detailed history. And the Supreme Court test involving the Establishment Clause of the United States Constitution, church and state separation, is highly fact-specific. And so my view on this case that the former Attorney General joined was that that is a Maryland case decided on Maryland facts coming from Maryland witnesses, and it was not a case that I could really make a, a rational judgment about, and it was not a Rhode Island case. And so I felt like if we're going to be in these cases, we've got to fully understand them, and they ought to have a direct impact on the state of Rhode Island. I believe that our office has to be laser focused on cases that impact Rhode Islanders directly. Now, there are some national cases that do that I believe we should be involved in. Uh, cases that involve emission standards or cases that involve uh, the Affordable Care Act. But to me, this was not one of those cases. This was a Maryland case, and, and Rhode Island really did not have a role here. If, if, is it fair for me to paraphrase that you're trying to bring some disciplined thinking to the office? Well, on these particular issues, I feel like before we get involved in a case, we ought to understand why we're getting involved. Got to have a test. Yeah, look, you, look, there are cases that are going to impact Rhode Islanders that are national in scope. I just didn't believe this was one of them, and it didn't make sense for us to be in it. When Look, if this had case had been in Rhode Island, I would have gotten my car and driven over to the Rotary and taken a look at it, because that's what the Supreme Court says, how you get to an answer in these cases. They're highly fact-specific. Right. If I got to drive to Maryland, I probably shouldn't be in the case. All right, so jumping on other AGs, you know, sometimes you guys do a little camaraderie thing, right, mm -hmm. trying to add muscle to somebody's mm -hmm. case. Uh, any chance Rhode Island jumps on California's lawsuit on this on this immigration on, on the border? We'll see. We'll see. You know, you're open to it. Yeah. You know. Look, I want to make sure that um, I want to make sure that there's a real impact on Rhode Island and it and it's um, it impacts in a very impacts us in a very direct way. Part of me feels like this is a a congressional issue mm -hmm. more than it is an AG's issue. So I want to examine that one a little bit more closely. Thanks for checking in. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Dan. Lots to talk about, huh? Final word and we come back. Well, coming up tomorrow, U.S. Senator Jack Reed will be here, and I think we've got a couple of things to talk about, right? In addition to just his perspective as a Democrat in the senior senator from Rhode Island, I hope to be able to get a little bit of an understanding as to behind the scenes what the Senate view is on this very, very contentious constitutional issue now with the emergency action that the president declared on Friday. So stay tuned for that. And don't forget, weekdays 3 till 6, we take your phone calls on WPRO and all of these matters and more. Thanks for watching. Good night.